All right, I'm going to start the lecture. I recorded all the, the lectures, which is a nice thing. And I'm, uh, I'm going to, there's this website, or it's, I guess it's a website, it's an interface, it's called kudu.com. And you can upload your stuff in there and give access to students. And I guess if you use their classes, they have like um, intro mechanics and things like that. Then the students pay fifty dollars, and you know to use their content. But you can use the platform for free if uh, if you upload your own stuff. So I'm going to upload the videos and the notes, um, and I'm going to leave them there, I guess, until the end of the internet. Now I think I'm going to do that with um, with my other classes too. I think my my astrophysics class was decent, and my thermal physics class last spring, this spring, last spring, this spring was good. And I'm going to use a different book for thermodynamics, so I want to keep both of them. So I just send you the link in case you are interested. Which book did you use for thermodynamics? I use the same as you used last. Can you tell? Uh, didn't you use the same book? No? Well, thank you. Mm. Okay. Well, you solved all the problems from Kitel, so. <laughs> <laughs> was What's that? No, it's thermal physics, not the yeah. Yeah, true, true. I guess I shouldn't call it thermodynamics. Um, I think Kitel is pretty good, but it doesn't have like all the newest stuff. Anyways, so I'll make that available to you in case you're interested. So what is the first thing formal physics, let's say, physics that you learn in a class called physics? Uh, what is the first thing that you learned that you looked at the first topic? Vectors. Vectors? Sounds like a decent first step. Why did you, why was, why was that the first topic? Because you have to start with forces. Did you start with forces? Well, no. Equations of motion using second law? Yeah. I mean, you start with like the vectors, the definition of velocity. So, really, you know, you're still doing the same thing. I don't know, you added some more complicated math, but it's still the same thing. It's equations of motion. Um, if you look at your other classes, you know, statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics, uh, optics, uh, everything is about how things move. And from that, you derive, uh, I guess, what we call physics. Everything really is about describing how things move. So when Newton f first derived you know, his, his laws, and when he invented calculus, kind of uh, gave the modern definition of vectors, when he did all that stuff, he described what he was seeing, you know, in, in physical space, what we call physical space. And he was, you know, kind of at the beginning of, the, of this course, we talked about how he had some issues with the third law, especially with, uh, uh, with the conservation of angular momentum. He didn't quite get it. Um, Newton was, mm, you know, watch this documentary that called him uh, like the last of the magicians rather than the first scientist. 
as you might think. Uh, he did all these uh, chemistry uh, experiments, I guess, trying to convert lead into gold. Um, but he had good insight. He realized that his laws were incapable of predicting the future of the Earth because he tried to account for all the interactions with all the other planets. He knew that there were limitations. He understood that. Um, you know, he didn't call it chaos. And instead of thinking that there was maybe a better theory or a, w a better way to describe these things, um, he said that God kept the solar system, you know, the Earth, uh, rotating around the sun. So where his theory failed, he said, well, God is going to fix this. Which is interesting. You know, fast forward 100 years or so, 150 years, and I think you reach the, the height of uh, reductionism, right? Thinking that even if you don't know exactly what the law is, there is a law that will allow you to predict everything in the universe. And, um, and I guess you, you get to this other extreme with, uh, with Laplace, who said that he didn't need that theory, right? He told that to uh, Napoleon, when Napoleon asked him why he didn't mention God in his treatise about the solar system. And he didn't say that he didn't believe in God, he just said that he didn't need that theory. Um, people assume that he was atheist. I guess it's not necessarily true. But if you look at, I haven't read the, the, uh, the books that Lagrange wrote, by the way, but I know that he talks about God, so he also um, was a believer. So, you know, I guess now we know that Laplace was wrong. There's chaos. We cannot predict exactly everything, everything that is going to happen. Um, in this trip, in this voyage, um, physics moved from you know, Newtonian mechanics to Lagrangian mechanics to Hamiltonian mechanics and maybe to um, Cooperman von Neumann mechanics. There's more mechanics. Um, what is the same and what is different about these and there's explanations or descriptions of, of mechanics? Look, for example, at the space. Yeah, vectors. So, what space is it? Position. Real space. Say that again. Real space. Real space. I would call it real. So you can also call it physical. so as to not get confused with the real numbers. You know, I guess he looked at things, he imagined vectors and how you know, the, the position and the velocity vector change. What about the Lagrangian? Generalized coordinates. Mm -hmm. How do you call that one? Space, space, space. Space, no. Um, configuration. Oh. What about Hamiltonian? Phase space. What about von Neumann? Hilbert space. Isn't that crazy? Um, 
So over here, what gives us the equation of motion for Newtonian mechanics? Well, you guys said it at the beginning. First equals ma. Sec Newton's second law. Lagrangian. Yeah. Uh, Euler Lagrange. Don't be mean to Euler. <laughs> Euler. What about in uh, the Hamiltonian? Surprise, Hamiltons. And here? It's not exactly the same. Um, the Schrodinger equation. But instead of using um, quantum probabilities, uh, classical probability. So, you guys have uh, solved maybe way too many problems with the uh, Lagrangian and Newtonian descriptions. Can you do the same things? Yeah? I mean, they are they were designed to do the same thing, right? To give you the equations of motion. Um, sometimes the Newtonian is easier, sometimes the Lagrangian is easier. Uh, I guess you don't have necessarily vectors with the Lagrangian. Um, what about the Hamiltonian? Where do you use it more commonly? And you want to measure the energy of the Yeah, so tell me in which classes you uh, use the Hamiltonian. Quantum? Yeah, why will you use the Hamiltonian in those? classes or in those fields. Find the energy. Hmm? Find the energy. Well the the Lagrangian gives you the energy. To show the time evolution. Time evolution? Of the you can do that with the Lagrangian and with the Newtonian. Yeah so it matches the energy? It's like total basically? Sometimes. I guess often. You can you can do Whatever you can do with one of them, you can do with all of them, right? So what is different is the kind of equations that you have. So the mathematics can be different. Um, um, over here with the Lagrangian, you have second order um, equations and you have N. So N is the number of degrees of freedom. And with the Hamiltonian, you have first order um, uh, equations, but you have twice as many. Right, just because it is linear? Yeah, so you know, it, it might be easier mm -hmm. in some cases. Uh, but whatever you can do with one, you can do it all with all of them. So they are all describing the same reality. And this is, you know, if you think about it, this is very. Um, I guess scary, awesome. We have looked at vectors, you know, and um, we have seen that you can have different descriptions. You know, the coordinate system, you can move it around, and the numbers, you know, the equations even describing your vector uh, can be different, but it's the same vector. And this is the same concept or the same idea. You have different mathematical treatments and they describe the same reality. So, you know, it's not surprising that you know, our civilization, uh, I guess our species, discovered Newtonian mechanics first because it's, it's a reality that we're in. 
But if you, if you think about it, there's nothing to say that, that it is the, the one that is real, right? So what is really the nature of reality? I don't know, it's tough. And, you know, I guess Feynman will say that nature doesn't care how you call it. We divide it because our minds are tiny, but um, we're not going to, I, I don't think we're, I don't know. This is a little bit like Zen, right? Like you can just sit down, look at the equation, try to think about it and go into some trance. Um, so the components, I guess the quantities of motion that you saw in your, in your first physics class is a position, velocity, and acceleration. So this one is related to the potential energy. This one is related to the kinetic energy. And this occurs when you have a change between these two. So if this is true, then every, every field will be described by, by these three quantities. Um, actually by, mostly by this one, or by the energy. The acceleration just tells you how these things are, these two are going to change. So what is the more, the most energetic thing that you know about? What is the energy of that energetic thing? to be per particle. What about uh, gamma ray? What is the energy of a gamma ray? Oops. In electron volts? But one. Well, I guess it can be more than one, but it can be a hundred. It's giga electron volts. And we call these high energy physics. Um, over here we have, you know, like, um, let's say, collisions of heavy ions. about mega electron volts, we call that nuclear physics. Um, if we go down one order of magnitude, uh, two orders of magnitude, so kilo electron volts, what do we find over here? X-rays, um, you know, energetic interactions. Um, I think this will be the regime of like uh, AMO atomic molecular optical, um, yeah, like x-rays. If we go down one order of magnitude, three orders of magnitude to electron volts, what's that? It's chemistry. Um, so chemical reactions. You break a bond, it's about one electron volt. If we go to milli electron volts, what do we find over here? Hmm? You guys should know this one. It's a pondus matter. Atomic vibrations. Um, 
vibrations in molecules. They have, you know, new electron volts, so solids, molecules. If we go down another three orders of magnitude to microelectron volts, what is that? It is the vacuum of space. So, you know, uh, again, we divide this in scientific fields. But ultimately, they are all about that. Position, the energy, and how the energy changes. Over here in condensed matter, I guess because, I guess in this regime, uh, you can have the, the kinetic energy is small enough that the potential energy can start to put things together, and you, know, you have plants and animals and humans. Um, here you have complex systems. So kind of cool, but in the end, you know, whatever, what you first learn about physics. Okay, so the difference between these two guys is just the space in which they are located. So I don't remember where I read this, but um, it made an impact on me. It said that, you know, at, at this level is where 10 years of education, I don't know, 12 years of education, finally allow you to start you know, grasping uh, physics as it is. You know, my favorite subject when I was a kid was natural science, or science. But it was just like a collection of facts, right? Memorized stuff. You know, even intro mechanics, quantum mechanics, you see some of the math, but it's a lot about memorization. Here, you know, there's, there's not much more. This is it. Sit down with them, think about them. So the Lagrangian is expressed in Q, Q dot, and time. And the generalized momenta is going to be the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to QI. And we have this relationship sometimes comes in handy. So that means that um, PI dot this guy is going to be the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q. So, yeah, these two, I guess I'm going to leave them over here. The Hamiltonian, I usually do that. Um, I guess it's the script. It's a function of Q, P, and T. So Q is your position coordinate. P is going to be the, uh, the corresponding 
uh, momentum coordinate, and t is just the time. So, I guess configuration space, you just have an axis that is difficult to visualize, but it's, uh, each one of them is orthogonal uh, to all the other ones. And in each one you have how the particle is moving in that axis, um, in that generalized coordinate axis, and how fast it is moving. And you know, that gives you a, a path in configuration space. Um, phase space, you have three coordinates for uh, position, so Q, and three coordinates, the corresponding coordinates for, um, uh, for the momentum. And you, know, you can put, you're going to have one of these for each particle. So this is going to give you your, you know, your, your phase space. It's going to be a, a region um, over there. And so how do we go from the Lagrangian description to the Hamiltonian description of mechanics? Do you remember, well, I don't know if you saw this in analytical mechanics, probably. Well, um, if you look at these guys over here, um, what makes them different? Hmm? The momentum. So you have to change this variable into this one, and then you get your Hamiltonian. How can you change a variable? Switch it. I guess you can just define like a new variable. But in this case, um, the math works out. So, I'm going to remind you of, um, well, first, the first law of thermodynamics. So du equals dq minus dw. I think if you're picky about it, you might do like a, a bar over there. I don't know. So what is, uh, what is q? Heat and w? Work. So if you have you know, something like you know a gas that you can expand, uh, then you get you can get something you know, similar to like the Carnot cycle. You have your PV uh, relationship. This is PV, and you know, the same process. Can visualize it in T S. Um, I don't remember usually which one you put down here, but it doesn't matter because it's a square. So then D U in this case is going to be um, T D S minus P D V. So D U is a function. Um, 
It's a really nice marker uh, of S and B. So we can do some um, jujitsu over here. Wait, it's not yet. The derivative of TS is TDS plus SDT. So we can rewrite this one as the derivative of the product of T and S minus SDT minus PDB. Just rewriting. And then we can define another function I guess for whatever reason, we can call it f. So the derivative of u minus ts is du um, minus d ts, so du I guess it ends up being with this one. We have the du over here, we can put it over here. It's just uh, minus sdt minus pdd. Okay, so this function f is a function of what? U and df. Say it, Omero. Do you want to say it? Uh, the vector, uh, one. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, what is the difference between U and F? Well, they are related for sure. We saw the procedure. One has uh, temperature. So, we change one variable, right? Um, how do we call F? What is F? Which one? Can you Helmholtz. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. You should not care about this. You should hate chemists. So if they if they tell you about Gibbs free energy, stop listening to them. Okay, so the rule was um, if you have a function df which can be expressed as um, u dx plus v dy and u is the partial derivative of f with respect to x, v is the partial derivative of f with respect to y. So I guess you can just put this one in there and there. And this is a very, you know, it's kind of a very specific form. But it happens to be what we have with the Lagrangian, we'll see. So if we want to change uh, this one, this one is a function of x and y. If we want to make it a function of will be x u and v, or I mean u and y, or x and v, we can apply this procedure. So the procedure is define another function, which is the original one, f, not the f, f minus, minus ux, take the derivative. So you get df minus ux. So this is df um, minus u dx minus x du. 
so this is gonna be, this is what we have defined over here. So it's u dx plus v dy minus u dx minus x du. This one goes away with this one and we have v dy minus x du. This is dg. So now it is in, it's a function of y and u, u and y. So that is the whole, the whole procedure. What will be the difference, you know, if we want to apply this to, uh, yeah, to go from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian? It's the same procedure, but you have to apply it many times. Yeah, with, with the moment. Uh, I guess with the, with the momenta. Because you have uh, one of these equations for each um, generalized coordinate. So this is a procedure that um, if, if you don't remember, uh, you have definitely you know, worked with this. So the, the free energy, I guess, uh, Helmholtz and Gibbs. So um, in the book, this one um, is equation 8.5. So it's um, your marker. A while back, we actually derived the Hamiltonian, but we used small h rather than big H. Why did we do that? You remember? We, I guess we looked at it, analyzed it. Um, we figured out that for the cases that we we're looking at, it was um, identical to the total energy. So the definition was little h, and it was a function of all the uh, the generalized coordinates and the time rate of change of the generalized coordinates. And the time. And it was equal to, at this time we had not started to use the uh, Einstein notation yet. So we had a sine Yeah, rings a bell. So we have uh, this one over here. So I guess that is equal to this, right? So this is, uh, we can rewrite it as, I'm gonna put it down here because I don't know, I hate this one. Maybe I can use it as the dot, yeah. There you go, now it has some function. Minus the Lagrangian. So a function of q, q dot, and the time. And if we use Einstein notation, you know, this is, you're going to have one of these for each i. So for every, um, for every degree of freedom. 
So we used little h because this was in, this is a function of the generalized coordinates, uh, rate of change of the generalized coordinates and time. But the real, I guess, if you can, well, if you want to call it that way, Hamiltonian is a function of the momenta. So here you have the definition, I guess, in the Lagrangian description. Uh, can we make this, you know, its own thing in um, Hamiltonian dynamics? Um, maybe. So we have the H, the derivative. Um, actually, I'm going to put this one over here. So dh is the, this is the total derivative of the Hamiltonian. So it's going to be partial derivative with respect to q, um, dq plus um, with respect to p, uh, dp, and with respect to time. And we have um, our definition over here. So this is equal to the little h. So derivative of that thing So is the derivative of this term minus the derivative of the Lagrangian? And that is starting to look a lot like the relationship between the, the energy and the free energy. So this one is Q, wait. I am missing a dot. Okay, so this is um, q dot dp uh, p dq. And this is the total derivative of the Lagrangian. So it's going to be minus um, partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to q dq, partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to q dot, dq dot, and partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time. So we have you know, that useful relationship again so this one is just pi. So we can substitute this one here. Or I guess p. Wait, I'm seeing 
Oh, this one is Q dot. Okay, so you can get rid of this one and this one. So we have Q dot DP partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q DQ and partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time dt. So that's kind of So how can we relate the dh with what we derived down there? What is what is the relationship? Say it on metal. Can you find the equation? Yeah, yeah, but so tell me how this equation and this one are related. Oh, so the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the uh, position is equal to the, the, the negative derivative of the Lagrangian. Yeah, there you go. So I guess actually just to make it more clear. Um, we have dq over here. Um, we can put it over here. dq, dp is this one. And then the dt is in the right place. So I'm going to remove this part just so that I can write it over here. So, partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the position is equal to the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q. Is my, are my signs right? No. Okay, I mean, we have a negative over here. And then we have the partial derivative uh, of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momentum is equal to Q dot and the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to time is, I think that's a negative, yes. So we can put the negative over here. Partial derivative of the Lagrangian uh, with respect to time. Have you seen these ones before? Yes? Yeah. So these are the um, Hamilton's yeah I think they're canonical equations of Hamilton I don't know how many ends are in canonical I used to know these things and autocorrect has destroyed my grammar you just have to write something that is close enough. It's horrible. Okay, so why, what, what is the relationship between the original um, Lagrangian, uh, other Lagrange equations that we were dealing with and, and, and these ones? This one, let's see if I can 
Let's add yeah, so this one is PI dot. It's over there. Okay, so that makes it look a little prettier. And we have the negative and the negative. So instead of having N uh, equations, second order, we have two N um, equations and then the, the time that are first order. So this allows you to describe certain systems in an easier way. And the rest of the chapter really is kind of um, showing you that what is true about the Lagrangian